Good morning. She's been Prime Minister since July and there has been, in effect, one single message. I'm Theresa, trust me. But now it's different. She's gone to the country asking for her own mandate and there is just such a lot we still don't know. This morning, in her first major television interview of the campaign, the Conservative leader, Theresa May. The words, strong and stable, won't, I'm sure, pass her lips once. And it's been a bruising first campaigning week for Tim Farron, leader of the Liberal Democrats. In theory, he should be able to scoop up many of the 48% who voted to remain. I said, in theory, Tim. And paper reviewers crossing the spectrum from Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator, to The Guardian's Owen Jones. And neatly sandwiched between the Johnson who's jumped, breaking her silence, Rachel Johnson, on why she has joined the Lib Dems. Plus, Damien Lewis has been telling me how an ex-president gave him advice on playing a bad boy billionaire. Barack Obama did say to me a few months ago, he said, um, he said, I'm loving Billions. I love your character in it. I love Bobby. The only problem is hedge fund managers aren't that cool. All of that coming up soon. But first, over to the newsroom and Catherine Downs. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning. Labour and the Conservatives will today focus their general election campaigns on proposals to improve workers' rights. Theresa May says the Conservative manifesto will include a commitment to give the pensions regulator new powers to protect workers' pensions and fine unscrupulous bosses. And as we heard, the Prime Minister will join Andrew later in this programme for a full interview. This week marks 10 years since the disappearance of Madeleine McCann during a family holiday in Portugal. Her parents have spoken to the BBC for a new programme focusing on the current state of the investigation. Jerry McCann talked about the impact of her disappearance on her siblings and the abuse the family had received on social media. People are, are writing things that are simply just untrue and they need to be aware of that. Both of us realised that we've owed it to the twins to make sure that their life is as uh, fulfilling as they deserve. And you can see that full interview on Panorama on Wednesday night at 9 o'clock on BBC One. Pope Francis has called for the United Nations to do more to ease tensions between the United States and North Korea. Speaking to reporters on the papal plane, he warned that the crisis over North Korea's missile program risked causing a devastating war in which a good part of humanity could be destroyed. Donald Trump is marking his 100th day in office with a rally in the state of Pennsylvania. The president told supporters he had been very productive, listing achievements such as revoking business and environmental regulations. He repeatedly criticised the news media and promised that there were great battles ahead in his presidency. And the British heavyweight boxer Anthony Joshua is celebrating after winning a thrilling title fight against the former champion Vladimir Klitschko. The fight in front of a crowd of 90,000 at Wembley Stadium was stopped in the 11th round. 27-year-old Joshua now holds the IBF, WBA and IBO heavyweight belts. And that is all from me. The next news is on BBC One at 1 o'clock. But for now, back to you, Andrew. Many thanks for that. And now, as ever, to the front pages of the papers. And there, indeed, is Anthony Johnson on the front of The Observer, alongside the story picked up by almost everybody after the EU summit. EU threatens Theresa May on trade talks and its citizens' rights, things we will talk about later in the programme, of course. There's the Mail on Sunday. Theresa, has given, Theresa May has given an interview, which we'll be talking about shortly. I'll wage war on pensions cowboys. People like Philip Green, she's talking about there. And there is the McCann story, again, on almost every front page, almost every paper, one way or another. It's on the front of the Sunday Mirror as well. There's the Sunday Times. May is living in another galaxy, says uh, Juncker, after those uh, difficult, that apparently difficult meeting with Theresa May. We'll be talking a lot about more. There is uh, Donald Trump after his 100 days saluting somebody or other. And there, finally, Sunday Telegraph may reject Brussels' demands. So they've turned that story around. And again, the boxing story, Joshua there. So lots and lots to talk about. Welcome to you all. Uh, Rachel, we'll be talking about you in many ways later on. But let's start off with The Sun. I think it's the first story you've chosen. Ah, yeah. Well, this is... Uh... 
The Sun's report of yesterday's uh, very rapid uh, Brussels summit in which they dis decided in four days to adopt their position, negotiating position, and the three top lines seem to be settle the rights of EU citizens, make sure there's no hard border in, in Ireland, Ireland yeah. and um, make sure you pay your divorce bill before we start talking about your free trade deal. Pay up first, in, yeah, in, in exactly. short, absolutely. Oh, and, it's uh, and David Davis, sorry, just to say that out of that politically, yeah. David Davis is admitting that this is going to be you know, confrontational and extremely difficult. Well, this is, I mean, it, it, again, it underlines it's a deceitful premise to this whole general election because Theresa May has argued that the more people vote for her, the more seats she gets, the stronger her mandate to go to the EU. The EU don't care how many votes she gets. She doesn't, they don't care how many seats they have. And I think there is a sense of denial, which the Conservative government is, is promoting, it, which is that we are going to have a strengthened negotiating hand when we're up against a whole range of EU states who have no, uh, you know, why sure. would they care about the election? No logic Fraser, Fraser, do you, do you, you think the number of seats it. that mm. Theresa May wins will have an effect on these negotiations? Yeah, I certainly do. I mean, of course, anybody who negotiates abroad, you know, they're asking, does this person have a strong mandate at home or a weak one? Theresa May's got no mandate right now. She doesn't, she can hardly command the complete loyalty of her own cabinet. I mean, so she goes for a general election, she comes back, say she comes back with a landslide, on a personal manifesto dictated by her own chief of staff, she would then go to Brussels as somebody who is a very rare thing in Europe, a, a prime minister who is able to come back and collect as many working class votes as middle class mm -hmm. votes. And you would, you would have, it would help. I'm not saying it'd be transformative. Just as an example, I mean, if you give Greece as an example, they held a referendum. 67%. I mean, they didn't had an do them any good overwhelming majority to reject the EU deal. The EU just went, yeah. why do we care? We have no yeah. interest in what but, you're doing. Can I just pick Fraser up on one thing yeah. before we move on? Which is well, the new yeah. Liberal <laughs> Democrat attack lines. <laughs> <laughs> No, I Ooh. haven't heard them, but <laughs> presumably the, re the reason she wants a strong mandate is that whatever the deal is, whether it's mm. a bad deal, a good deal or no deal, it will be voted through the Commons without too much stress and opposition. Yeah. Isn't that I, the entire so point of having a, a mandate for this? I want to follow that up, if I may, Sorry. because the, the money issue is the first issue that's coming up, and there's talk of anywhere between 40 and 60 billion pounds. It may be a lot less than that, but it does look, does it not, as if Theresa May is going to have to agree some kind of financial settlement early in the process. And at the moment, I would have thought that kind of settlement would not get through the Conservative Party in the House of Commons. Well, certainly the Foreign Secretary is against anything like this happening. Um, I mean, Theresa May herself um, says this is the Sunday Telegraph splash, but this is, she's dismissed it as a negotiating position. The, we're, just, we're in talks about talks right now, yeah. and they have said, look, until we talk about the divorce bill, we're not going to talk about trade. Yeah. Now, that is not Britain's understanding of how the talks should carry out, but how much leverage does Britain have to tell the rest of the EU how the negotiations are going to take place? The one weapon Theresa May does have is, will she walk away if she doesn't get what she wants? And over now, the cliff. Well, she used, to say, um, she used to say that no deal was better than a bad deal. Apparently, she stopped mm. saying that now. Well, so we'll, we'll find out mm. shortly, but, but th that was one of the questions that the Mail on Sunday put to her in her first uh, newspaper well, interview. Owen. Well, good luck with your interview, because the <laughs> Mail have got absolutely nothing. I mean, it is insulting, I have to say, to call a general election and have nothing of any substance to say on any domestic issue. I mean, if you read, I mean, look, it's quite interesting. It talks about going to church. Very nice. No hard Brexit or soft Brexit cliches. I think the problem is, you know, it's kind of twofold. What you're going to end up with is a situation. Can I guess how the interview is going to pan out? Basically, Linton Crosby has implanted implants into people's oh, and Tory MPs' brains. We're very much hoping that people will carry on watching. Well, That's what I would say. And, to and I would say, what she will do is she will avoid saying anything of substance and stick to lines which she's going to repeat over and over again until people's ears bleed. The other point, though, is, it's why would anyone trust the single word that she says? She came into your studio over and over again and said that there would, and other studios saying there would be no snap election. There was the premise she gave for giving one was that she was being obstructed in terms of Brexit in the Houses of Parliament. That's a straightforward untruth, overwhelmingly got through the House of Commons. National insurance, mm. do you remember that? Uh, a Tory manifesto commitment, she so went back on it. You can't not surprisingly, trust, you don't think you can trust but her. But you can't trust, whatever policies but or the, pledges but, she comes up with this election, you can't trust a word that this woman says. The public do disagree. Her approval rating is off the scale. Never has any prime minister since polling began 
been so liked in the country. Now, this is, you might, people in Westminster might say, we can't believe she promised you wouldn't do something, then she did it. This is exactly true. She calculated that she could get away with it. People would think that Jeremy Corbyn was such a bad alternative that she could pretty much do anything she wants. And so far, like it or lump it, she is right. And watching all of this debate, lots of people are changing their minds and moving all over the place. And Rachel Johnson, you have written in the Mail on Sunday about your decision to move from the Conservatives, or from, from no, because you left yeah. the Conservatives already, to the Lib Dem. And that caused a little bit of trouble in the family, I would imagine. Uh, well. What did the what did the what did the top brothers? What did the big brother say? <laughs> Large brother. That, the that's brother. got to remain a private conversation. <laughs> um, did he call you a mugwump? No, I don't know. Still don't know what a mugwump is. I but I mean, know. I think I've been completely consistent uh, in my position on Europe, and I think this is a single issue election. And on that single issue, this is a protest vote that I'm making. And I want to draw attention, use whatever platform I have, as a freelance columnist, mm. uh, and, and occasional appear on television, to draw attention to the fact that we could be going over a cliff in a hard Brexit. And only one party out of all our parties is offering the voters a second look at the deal, whether it's a bad deal, a good deal, a red, white and blue deal, or a Theresa May Brexit. Are you gonna stand? And I you... think that is incredibly important, because as things stand, with a Tory election landslide, there is not gonna be another look at the, the Commons has a vote, but no veto over the eventual deal. Mm -hmm. But if it go to a second referendum, the country has another go. And I think that's in crucially important because you have Brexit, actually joined the party. I have actually joined the party. You can't stand as a candidate because you've joined too late, as it were. Oh. But there is speculation in one of the papers that they might stand as they might want you as the London I'm mayoral afraid, candidate. A second was, Johnson for London mayor. I think that was mayor. my own paper making, possibly making mischief to embarrass me, but I don't know. And um, you obviously, rule it out then, I did, oh. <laughs> she's not ruling it out. I'm not we can all see that. In or out, but you when know, he stand in Uxbridge. <laughs> There's a very, very good candidate in Uxbridge who had a stonking majority when he was, uh, when he was re-elected in you, 2015. You have said in your piece, Rachel, that, that, that uh, your brother Boris has offered a false good of a uh, bill of sale. I on agree Brexit. with that, and I've said that to him. I think that ever, all the offer, the offer on the table is now everything on the table before June the 23rd is now off the table. I mean, From money back to the NHS. Mm to control of immigration, which David Davis has said we need to have immigration, to the single market. But business desperately needs us to stay in the single market and we're, not, we're going to have to leave the single market. It's all lose-lose. Right. Um, can I turn to the next big battleground we haven't mm -hmm. talked about, which is of course Scotland, and um, Ruth Davidson has a big splash there. Fraser Nelson, I think I read in your organ um, last week that um, Theresa May is now very, very close to mm -hmm. Ruth Davidson. They've got each other on speed dial. They're, they're talking all the time. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yes. I mean, Ruth Davidson is achieving miracles for the Conservatives in Scotland. So there was a poll a few days ago showing that a third of Scots intend to vote Tory in the next election. I never thought I would see that again. I mean, it's been 25 years since the Tories had more than one seat in Scotland. Now the polls suggest they might get as many as 12 seats. Um, even my, my own seat, my, my family's seat of Murray in, um, up in the northeast, where Angus Robertson, the SNP uh, leader in Westminster, that is now the top Tory target there. So, you know, something is going... What's happening in Scotland, of course, is that the idea of another referendum is filling unionists with dismay. Mm. But Jeremy Corbyn is a bit ambivalent about this, as he is ambivalent about Brexit. So Ruth Davidson, somebody who only joined the Tories a few years ago herself, is able to say, look, if you really didn't want this referendum, only one party can stand up to it. And this has given mm. the Conservatives the entree, mm. which I personally never thought they would have. Very, very interesting in Scotland. Um, one of the dangers of these campaigns is we talk endlessly about process and polls and who's going to do worse or badly, and we don't talk about the policies. So, Owen, you've chosen, I think, a spread on Labour policies yeah. in the mirror. Talking about substance in an election, honestly, this is... I'm a sorry, we'll, we'll be um, brief. Uh, so this is Labour's offer in terms of on workers' rights, for example, a £10 uh, living wage uh, yeah. for the minimum wage. We've gone through the longest fall in living standards since the 19th century, since the, since the Napoleonic Wars, in fact. That would also reduce the burden on the taxpayer, yeah. lessen in work yeah. benefits. But also, critically, that workers would have the same rights from day one. As we know, when it comes to immigration, one of the mm. big concerns people have is undercutting. So what Labour are proposing here is measures uh, to stop that from happening. Now, I suppose yeah. what Labour have to do without going to, you know, there's two extremes, isn't there? No substance, sticking to a message over and over again lots of ideas but without a clear message. So what Labour has to do now with all of these policies 
is have clear, clear sharp right, messages you know. that can cut through. You were somewhat critical of Jeremy Corbyn in the past. You've seen him in the first week or so of this campaign so far. What do you make of the performance? Well, I think what's interesting is, you know, <laughs> Theresa May has avoided the general public. You've had these stage-managed rallies. And I think what will be interesting is see if it cuts through, but actually having a grassroots campaign where you go around the country mm. where it's not managed, where you don't start get in an office and tell all the workers they have to go home uh, and then get in, parachute in party activists. So it's a more kind of grassroots, natural campaign. And as we know, whatever you think about Jeremy Corbyn, what does he relish? He relishes campaigning. He His relishes campaign. going out there. The, the entire mainstream media have gone, nah, 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 you're rubbish to Jeremy Corbyn all mm -hmm. the way through. Is there a chance that the mainstream media are wrong and this is a man who can turn things around? Absolutely. I, mean, the, the, I think it's amazing how everybody thinks this election is so in the bag. When you think that all the elections previously, for the last three years, we've had nothing apart from people like me being confounded. So I would be surprised if there are no surprises in this election. I don't think Jeremy Corbyn is going to win, but the Tory majority might not be in the sort of 150 scale that some people are talking about. It might be a lot more modest. Now, of course, the question is what happens to Labour after this. Now, it could well be that Jeremy Corbyn rids himself of lots of the more moderate Labour MPs and has got an even stronger hold on his party. Okay. But I think so much is in play, and who knows, even a Lib Dem revival ought not to be ruled out completely. OK, let's, let's end by talking about politics elsewhere. You have a tablet there, Owen, um, with... Trump's 100 days discussed on it. Well, I'm relieved it's been 100 days in one sense because some people thought we'd been nuclear Armageddon by this point. But um, <laughs> it's been a chaotic 100 days, as would have been expected. He said uh, in an interview last week, which amused some, that it was harder uh, than he expected. Who, who would have thought being a reality TV yeah. star was not quite as hard as being president of the United States? But look, what we're seeing, you know, we're seeing sharp kind of U-turns, vacillations. What I think is disturbing at the moment is he's now returning to the kind of... I suppose, white nationalism. Ba um, Steve Bannon is being rehabilitated. He's now angrily yesterday talking about the need to build, of course, the wall uh, and make Mexico... Do we think the wall will actually ever be built now? That's the question. <laughs> because uh, if he doesn't build the wall, that's his biggest single campaign mm -hmm. promise broken. Well, I think what he's going to do in the uh, con next congressional elections is try to dare the Democrats to vote against. Uh, but, you know, the idea Mexico is ever going to pay for this wall. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, we'll see. I mean, it, it, interesting at the moment, okay. because obviously we've got this brinkmanship over North Korea and... Sorry, I should stop there. No, no, I'm talking no, too much. I, I, know you, I, I know you're going out to campaign. You're going to be on the doorstep. Rachel, are you going to be on the doorstep? Are you actually knock on doors and talk to voters and say, I'm Rachel Johnson? Vote Lib Dem? I am very tempted to campaign in, in my constituency of Kensington and Chelsea because we're a Remain constituency with a Brexit. As so many London as, ones with are. a Brexit. Wouldn't uh, you Tory you should get a Twickenham doctor, or somewhere yes. more on the line? I mean, Kensington well, is Chelsea. I, I'm, I'm, never I'm take open that. to suggestions, but You've I have got to be careful. Political career yeah, very interesting. Well, you can all phone in your suggestions. Polite <laughs> yeah. suggestions, please, only. Thanks all very much Thank indeed you. for that. Thank and so to the weather. Bright and cold. I guess you could say strong and stable conditions with no sign of spring chaos. But will next week bring good meteorological news for the many and not the few? Sarah Keith Lucas can tell us. Sarah. <laughs> Well, Andrew, as we head through next week, actually, the weather's looking fairly dry, fairly settled, but we've got a bit of rain in the forecast through the remainder of the bank holiday weekend. We're not all going to see it at all. There's some bright, some breezy weather. Here is the scene in Northumberland taken earlier on in the morning. So as we head through the rest of today, it's turning quite breezy wherever you are in the UK, and there'll be some rain arriving in the southwest. We've already seen that wet weather working in across Cornwall, parts of Devon too. This area of rain working northeastwards into the south of Wales, central southern England on into the afternoon. Towards the northeast of that, though, most places dry and fine, and we're likely to see temperatures up to 16 or 17 degrees. So pleasantly warm for many of us, but quite a brisk southeasterly wind blowing. That's the scene as we head through into this evening and overnight. Clear and quite breezy in the north, whereas across the southern half of the country, low pressure still dominating. So some scattered showers, quite a bit of cloud, keeping things frost-free across England and Wales. But it is a little bit fresher first thing further north. Now through bank holiday Monday then, a cool easterly breeze blowing across Scotland and Northern Ireland but some sunshine in the west, England and Wales seeing a mix of sunshine and scattered showers. But through much of the week ahead, the largely dry theme continues with the best of the sunshine for western areas and cooler conditions across the east. Andrew.
coats on for all canvassers. Now, this election was supposed to be the Lib Dems' great opportunity to rise from the dead and speak for the millions who voted to remain inside the EU. Instead, and rather bizarrely, Tim Farron's opening days were sidetracked by a row over whether or not, as a committed Christian, he believed gay sex was a sin. So, can he recover? Well, Tim Farron joins me now. Morning, Andrew. Before we turn to that issue, good morning, Tim. Um, there's a slight air of unreality hanging over your campaign at the moment because you have said, I want to be leader of the opposition, and you have said, this is the chance for the British people to change the course of the country when it regards to, with regard to Brexit. Given the number of MPs you've got and your realistic opportunities, that's going it a bit, isn't it? Well, look, nobody can affect the result of the last general election. We can hopefully affect the result of the one that's coming. And let's not pretend the Prime Minister has chosen this election for any other reason than a cold, calculated desire to do what is right for the Conservative Party, not for the country. So she expects some kind of coronation. What's blindingly obvious is that Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party are obsessed with fighting amongst themselves. There is a vacancy for the Leader of the Opposition. And I say, given this is a historic moment for Britain, whether we choose to go over the mm. cliff edge of a hard Brexit, or whether we choose to let the people decide on the terms of the deal, the Liberal Democrats put ourselves in a position where we will say we will be the opposition, the strong opposition, that Britain desperately needs. I want to come on to the reality of how many seats you might get and so forth later on, but you have had a very, very difficult first week over the whole gay sex issue. And it wasn't the big problem with this, that the very voters you most need to win over young liberal minded europhile voters are the ones most worried about your position well i wouldn't have spent i wouldn't have chosen to spend you know some of the mm. first week talking about my uh, personal faith but you can't affect what people choose to ask you um, what i do choose to do is say to the british people this is the biggest choice we face in a generation we have this enormous issue about whether we leave the single market whether we go for a hard brexit whether we are forced to accept a deal that will affect all of us yes. for generations and yet we have a labor a party that has held Theresa May's hand as they jumped off the cliff edge to a hard Brexit. And this is an important moment. So for young people, sure, people sure. voted Remain, but also those people who voted Leave and think nevertheless the Prime Minister is taking us in a wrong direction. The Liberal Democrats are offering you the chance to change the future of this country. Do you accept that the gay sex row deflected your message in a crucial part of the campaign well, and they're the same voters who are also very, very worried about the tuition fees? They remember the tuition fees promise and they're still angry about that. Well, then they'll remember that I was uh, one of the, uh, the largest number of Liberal Democrats ah, who voted against the, the tuition way. fee. Right. So the question but, is, but are also, you going to change the policy? But I also take the view that we are looking at something that is going to cast mm. Britain's future for 20, 30, 40 years. So you're right in many ways to focus on young voters, they'll be the ones living with the consequences of the deal that we don't know the outcome of yet. I mean, this week we've so seen... So on tuition fees, are you going to change the policy? Well, we want it to be a, a fairer system. We believe uh, that, that fees and indeed what one pays back afterwards should reflect your ability to pay. Uh, we got a better deal from the Tories than they were going to give us on our own. But the cre real issue here is how do you produce and provide for young people, for all people, a future that is brighter than the one we're currently going to get. At the moment, the Prime Minister has chosen to have a general election on her terms because she assumes an enormous majority. And around the country, there are very few people, I think, including myself, who expect anything other than Theresa May to be in 10 Downing Street on the 9th of June. And the question is, will she be properly opposed? It cannot be by Jeremy well, Corbyn and the Labour Party. This, because you have said also that you wouldn't do a coalition deal either with Theresa May or with Jeremy Corbyn. Now, if you want to affect the way the government behaves after this election when it comes to Brexit. You want maximum leverage, and you seem to be saying, yeah, but I'm going to throw away any possible lever I might have, however well I do. I think the most important thing for a leader is, is clarity. Clarity yes. number one is to be honest with you and everybody else. We all know it's the truth that the, the Prime Minister is heading for a colossal coronation on the 8th of June. Uh, clarity point number two, so let's not pretend there's going to be any hung parliament. A anyway, colossal coronation. But, uh, it, that's how it looks to me. And she expects the British people to turn up in their Sunday best and to wave the flag. That is not how a democracy works. And we're determined to turn the coronation she expects into a contest that Britain desperately needs. The second reason we've been very clear that we'll not be having a coalition with Labour or the Tories is because I want people to look at the Liberal Democrats and realise when they vote for us, they're not voting for us as a proxy for anything else. They're voting for the Liberal Democrats' mm. plan to invest in health and social care, you sound to a invest bit. in education and to make sure that Britain does not head off the cliff edge of a hard Brexit, that the British people have the final say, 
not the politicians. You sound to me that at the beginning of this campaign you have, in effect, given up. It's all Theresa May's. We might as well walk away and, and um, well, pick up our business afterwards. Well, we're not walking away. So Jeremy Corbyn appears to be fighting the next Labour leadership election. The Labour Party are fighting amongst themselves and have given up on the job of opposing the government. Britain desperately needs a strong, decent opposition for the sake of democracy. You don't need to agree with me on everything to agree with me that Britain needs a strong opposition and the Liberal Democrats are determined to provide it. Now, if you want to be leader of that opposition, then you need to go from eight seats to, what, 130 seats? 100, I mean, it would be the biggest change in the Liberal Democrats' fortunes in living memory. In, no, not living memory, in memory of any kind. Historians would be struggling to find any parallel. And a lot of people listening to what you say about the coronation and looking at the polls and say, this is a complete fantasy. Tim Farron might want to believe it briefly, uh, as he's shaving first thing in the morning, but nobody else will. Well, I mean, I think I'm probably one of those self-aware politicians. I'm aware of all the things that you say. I'm also aware that a week ago, the two main parties in France came third and fifth. These are times when politics in the Western Hemisphere, at least, has never been more unpredictable. This is also an election that Theresa May has chosen not to get a mandate, she doesn't need a mandate, and how can you have a mandate on something that's not mm. been written yet anyway, right. the deal, but it is an election nonetheless that could absolutely change the course of British political history. If you cannot be ambitious right. at this point to allow those millions of people who are appalled by the direction the Prime Minister is taking us in, not just out of Europe, but out of the single market without the British people having the final say, if you want to prevent the calamity of that hard Brexit, you have one option, it is the Liberal Democrats and you need to take it. And to get to those seats, you need lots and lots of metropolitan and university towns, all those seats which voted Remain last time. But you also need to clean up a lot of seats in the, in the, in the South West. But the South West is exactly the part of the country that voted for Brexit. I can I remember an old liberal tradition when the old liberals in the South West were very Eurosceptic, they were right of centre, and that tradition has more or less died in your party. Well, I want to go on for a, a, a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but you will remember that I resigned from the Liberal Democrat from, from bench about uh, ten years ago mm. because I am a bit of a Eurosceptic. I'm somebody who challenges people in power, the EU, mm. in government, in councils, but I'm, not a, I'm somebody who believes that Britain is better off in the European Union. And what the South West is famous for is wanting to be able to be self-governing, to be independent, to be different from those in Westminster right. who tell them what to do. And the worst thing for the West Country is to be a blanket of blue where the Tories just take you for granted. And that's the thing I think people around the country are, are beginning to realise, that a Conservative majority is now not in question. But a now, Conservative landslide means they will take you for granted wherever you live. So you are looking for an extraordinary change in the politics of this country. We read today that you've been talking to Tony Blair about this. Can you tell us anything about the conversation and whether there is some prospect from your point of view of a major realignment after this election. Well, I mean, several months ago I met with uh, Tony Blair at his request. I thought it was only courteous to do so. Um, I have many uh, very, very clearly on the record uh, disagreements with Tony Blair, not least over the illegal and counterproductive war in Iraq. But I do admire Tony Blair for one thing in particular, and that is his ability to put together a small C coalition that was able to win a general election and defeat the Conservatives in 1997. I admire progressives, and he is broadly, I guess, a progressive. I admire progressives who are able to win elections because if you cannot win, then you cannot change people's lives. The NHS so, so is in can, danger can I, can I, as okay. long as progressives can I cannot win, to my that's original, why it's important that we do. Can I come back to my original question, which is, do you see, therefore, beyond this election, some major realignment in British politics? Well, I'm focusing on this election, and let's remember where the progressive forces uh, are at the moment, if you want to call them that. Everybody knows that the SNP can only gain one seat off the Tories. That's all they've got mathematically available to them, unless there is a, you know, an aggressive foreign policy coming from <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon soon. Yeah. I wouldn't write it out, but that's where things are. One gain possible. Everybody accepts, everybody accepts. Labour are going backwards, not forwards. So the only flank through which Theresa May is even remotely vulnerable and where progressives have any chance of defeating Conservatives is the Liberal Democrats. Right. Yes, in the West Country, in my part of the world of the North West, here in London, if you want a strong opposition, the Liberal Democrats are now your only choice. Okay. Pity you couldn't find a seat for Rachel Johnson. Well, Rachel's a, a fantastic addition to the team. We picked the right sibling, or rather she picked us, and it's an absolute blessing to us Would to have somebody... Would you like to see her stand as London Mayor in the Liberal Democrat cause shall in due I, course? I mean, I'm sure she'd be marvellous at it, but shall I say that's an election for, what, three years down the road and we'll worry about that after the one we're currently fighting. Plenty of time to talk in due course. Tim Farron, thank you very Andrew. much indeed for talking to us. Now, coming up later this morning, Andrew Neil will be talking to the former leader of the Scottish National Party, Alex Salmond, and to the current leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood.
That's the Sunday politics at 11 here on BBC One. <clears throat> now, Damien Lewis excels at playing the most alpha of males. From Henry VIII in Wolf Hall to Brodie in Homeland, Lewis has often shown masculinity at its most bruising. His return to the London stage, however, will leave quite a few of their fan, those fans with their jaws on the floor, because in Edward Albee's absurdist play, The Goat, Lewis plays an architect who falls in love with, yes, a goat. We met up to talk about that play, but first we discuss his latest TV hit, Billions, in which he plays a ruthless hedge fund bruiser from the Bronx. You are all playing it safe for the quarter, so you have a shot of personally being up on the year. You are all selfish, looking to mitigate your downsides and protect your bonuses. The only currency that this firm has that any firm has these days is its winning streak, the Kevlar of knowing the answer. You break that, you break the whole thing. As somebody who really enjoys Billions, I think the criticism of Billions is that if this is a satire of the rich and powerful and morally bad these days, it doesn't work because they're too attractive. Um, I'm going to, yes, I'm, I'm going to drop a name here and I'm going to enjoy it enormously. The President of the United States, uh, Barack Obama, did say to me a few months ago, he said, um, he said, I'm loving Billions. I love your character in it. I love Bobby. The only problem is hedge fund managers aren't that cool. Just to speak to, speak to your point. He has a swagger. They don't all. They absolutely don't. Um, there is, there is a sense of them digging their heels in and being the kid in the corner of the playground, you know, shouting, but I'm right, I'm right, I know I'm right. Um, they do bet against the tide. And that's perhaps the one minute Slightly romantic thing you can say about them. You've been served with a loss of 127 of them. Boom, body shot. And what happens after that is then up for discussion. We don't have long enough for that now. I don't think this series will last through seasons three, four, and five without the core rotting. Yeah. I, I don't think that will happen. Right. So Edward Albee, recently deceased, yeah. great, great American playwright, but this is one of his oddest plays, The Goat. Just tell us a little bit about the basis of the play. Um, well, the play, uh, the play just in its purest form is about a man who has an affair with a goat. Uh, and we find him at a moment when I think he's seeking an intervention of some sort. It has started to uh, gnaw at him. He's been doing it for six months. His wife is heartbroken by the infidelity first, and we have an exploration of love and, um, and infidelity and the different manifestations of love. And then on the other level, um, there is his need to normalise what he's done. What's so wonderful and brilliant about the play is that you are asked as an audience member to engage fully in the idea that he has had a relationship with... It's real. ..with an animal. Because I thought afterwards, this is clearly an adultery play. Albee has written another adultery play. There are so many adultery plays. Yeah. And what he's done is he's made it interesting by twisting it and making the other woman a goat. But that's fair enough up to a point, except the whole... whole premise of the play is that this is real. This is a real affair. He really has had sex with a goat. Yes, I think it becomes a, a somewhat absurdist affair at times, mind-bending at times, because the clarity and sincerity with which he has had this affair uh, is real. Um, the, 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 and the, the most genuine way in which that can be performed by me, and then subsequently the horror and the heartbreak and the on the other of side of the argument from his wife, his son, and his best friend, um, is what makes is, is what makes it such a strange evening. I notice people coming out of this play afterwards looking completely shocked. It is still a very shocking play. Um, Albee is going through a kind of revival. There's another Albee play up the road yeah. um, going on at the moment. But I yeah. wonder whether this play would have been put on without you in it. In other words, this sense in the West End, there has to be a really big top A-star actor or actress to bring in the punters. Um, I'm not quite sure that the entire audience knew what they were getting into when they arrived here. Well, let's go and look at Damien Lewis in the West End. That'll be fun. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I, well, flattery will get you everywhere. So, I think the thing to say about the West End is it's tremendous fun for precisely that reason. Um, I've done a play with um, plays with people much more famous than me, and they, you, you, 
there is a sense that people are coming for the first time. It feels a bit like part concert, part um, sort of happening, where they're just going to be in the same space as someone that they adore. And what can then happen can be remarkable and exciting and challenging. As people, certainly in a play like The Goat, people have a real experience of theatre for the first time. And I think they go away hopefully thinking, oh my God, that theatre was, was rather an amazing evening beyond just seeing who we came to see. It's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks so Thank much. You. Cheers. Thank you. And you can catch The Goat by Edward Albee at the Theatre Royal Haymarket in London's West End until the 24th of June. Now a look at what's coming up straight after this programme. Join us from 10 from York, where we'll be debating if it's right to refuse operations on the NHS due to, to the obese and to smokers. And then, with food banks busier than ever, is welfare reform working? And last, Actions versus worship is what you do, more important than what you believe. See you at 10 on BBC One. And now I am joined live in the studio by the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Good morning, Prime Minister. Morning, Andrew. Um, can we agree to start with that the one thing that voters deserve in what you yourself have said is going to be a very, very important election is no sound bites? Well, it is absolutely crucial because this is, uh, I think, the most important election that mm. this country has faced in my lifetime that when people look at this election and when they hear what the politicians are saying, they think about the national interest. That should be what drives people when they go to vote. But no slogans. We can, we can agree, we can <laughs> now, agree for the now, next come on, Andrew, minutes. You're, 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 you minutes. know that we will all be talking. As we go through this election, every party will be talking about what they think is important. I'll be talking about... Strong the, and stable leadership. Well, I'll be talking... And there's a reason for talking about... Yeah. strong and stable leadership and having a strong and stable government. It's precisely because this is the most important right. election the country's faced in my lifetime. It's about the future of the country. It's about the national interest. It's just that people can listen to that kind of thing and think it's a bit robotic. No, it's... it's the, when I talk about leadership, when I talk about the strength mm. of the government for the future, I do it for a reason, and the reason is this. We are facing a moment of change in this country. We're facing a moment when we have the opportunity to take this country forward, to make it an even better place to live for people th for their futures, a more secure future for people. But part of that, part of doing that, is about getting the Brexit negotiations right. And it's important when we go into those negotiations, and we've already seen some of the comments that have been coming out of Brussels, which show that at times these negotiations are going to be tough. So in order to make sure that we get mm. the right result, the best deal for this country, the deal that's going to work for people across the whole of this country, we need to ensure that we've got a strong hand in that negotiation. And that's what I'm talking about when I say to people, um, I want people to go out and vote. I want everybody to go out and vote on June the 8th because this is such an important election. Of course, I ask them to vote right. for me, but I want to make sure everybody goes and casts their vote. I'm going to come on to the, the, the Brexit issue uh, in a moment, but the other big thing about this election is that you are standing for the first time asking for your own mandate and your own name. And one of the questions people are asking, is this going to be, as it were, continuity David Cameron and George Osborne, or is the government, is the Conservative Party, taking a subtly different direction under Theresa May? Look, I served uh, in David Cameron's cabinet. I served as Home Secretary for six years, and I was very proud to serve with David. And if you look at what he did in government, he took a country from the brink of bankruptcy to a point where we had growth uh, and uh, where we see the deficit coming down by two-thirds. And... It's because of the decisions that government took that we now see, for example, 1.8 million more children in good or outstanding schools. But of course, on my own person, uh, there are issues that so I think we need to. So, what is the different direction we're looking for? Issues that I think we need to to uh, uh, address in this country. First of all, of course, the circumstances have changed. So we do need to deliver on Brexit. That's what people have asked mm. us to do, and that's what I'm determined to do and get the best deal for this country. Mm. Um, but also, I think that there are Issue, long-term issues that we need to address, long-term issues about the impact of the ageing population, for example, long-term issues about what sort of economy we want well, to be exactly. in the future. Be because meanwhile, we have in this country a huge number of working people, particularly public sector workers, who have now had seven years of below inflation pay increases, a, a really tough freeze on their pay. That can't go on, can it, in the next few years? Or, or is it vote vote Tory and get more public sector pay freezes? No, we've had to take some tough decisions about the public sector, about public spending. 
we did that because of the state of the economy that we were left uh, mm. by the Labour Party when we came in in 2010. Now we need to look to the future and we need to address the longer term issues that the country, the longer term challenges the country are facing. We need to ensure that we are uh, getting decisions in the public sector right, but also that we have well, the strong economy. Because you're talking about good pay in the public sector, uh, and you can only ensure that we're putting the money that we need into the public sector if you've got a strong economy to pay for it. What? Now, you will only get that with strong government. You will only get that with a government that understands the importance of growth in the economy uh, and ensuring that government okay, is well doing what it needs to encourage that growth. Let's pluck out a specific example. Lots and lots of young people do a job that I wouldn't do and perhaps you wouldn't do. They decide to become nurses and give something back. Now, according to the Royal College of Nursing, they have at a 14% pay cut since 2010 and we now get stories again from the RCN of lots of ordinary nurses by the end of the week having to use food banks because they can't afford to pay for food. That is not the kind of country that you want to run, is it? I want a, a country that works for everyone, not just the privileged few. If we look at what happens, well, if, we, if we look at what, uh, at, uh, what is happening mm. in relation to pay within the National Health Service, in fact, when you look at basic pay together with progression pay, actually for around half of NHS staff, they have uh, annual increase of around, uh, on average, 3% three, 3 rather than the, the, uh, just the 1% basic pay. But I come back to the, the, the key question, which is, we have, and if you look at the National Health Service and funding in the National Health Service, we're putting £10 billion but extra have, into I'm it. I'm sorry, Prime Minister, but, but we have nurses going to food banks at the moment. That must be wrong. We have, and there are many complex reasons why people go to, go to food banks. And I want to develop yeah. an economy where, yes, we have a strong economy so that we can pay for the public services that people need, but also we have an economy where we're creating secure jobs and well-paid jobs mm. and higher-paid jobs for people. Well, but you're only going to do that if you've got... The they haven't got enough money to but, eat at the moment. But if you're only going to be able to do this if you have a government that understands the importance of that strength in the economy. If you look at the proposals that the Labour Party are coming forward with, mm. they're nonsensical proposals which simply don't okay, add well, up and would actually lead, the, actually lead to less money being available for the National Health Service, less money being available for public sector pay and higher taxes on people. Under the Conservatives, under your government, the record number of food parcels last year has been handed out, according to the Dressel Trust. 1.2 million food parcels in this country. You said that on, on, on number 10 doorstep that you were going to be out there for the, for the ordinary working people. Those are people yes. who are really, really suffering. And I've asked you, under your government, if people vote Conservative again, is that going to carry on? And the answer seems to be yes. I, know, I haven't said that, Andrew. What I have said is that what I, if I'm elected as Prime Minister, if a Conservative government is elected, what we will be doing is working to create a strong economy in this, in this country, an economy which ensures that we're creating secure and higher paid jobs for people. I want people to have security for their future. Mm -hmm. But to do that, we need to get the Brexit negotiations right. To do that, we need to ensure we're developing our economy. That's why I've introduced a modern industrial well, strategy. Well, let's carry on it's talking. About firms growing and prospering. But it's also about making sure that prosperity and growth is around the whole of the country let's, and not well, just talk about confined to certain parts let's of the country. Let's talk about the whole of the country and again about working families. There are lots of benefit cuts in the pipeline. If they were introduced now, then three million, family, three million households in this country would be on average £2,500 worse off. Again, if they vote Conservative, that is what is going to happen. We have made changes to welfare as a Conservative government and there's a reason for doing that, which is we want to ensure that, of course, there is a welfare system that gives people support when they need that support. Mm -hmm. But I also want to see a welfare system that is helping to encourage and see people getting into the workplace. I think work is the best route out of poverty. And as we look These at how we do that, families I'm as, discussing. As, well, as we do that, we need to ensure also that we are being fair to working families, to the taxpayers who are actually paying for those benefits. That's why we've made, we have made a number of changes to the benefit system this to seems... ensure that there are more incentives in the benefit system for people to get into work. But yes, if we're talking about working families, what is important is ensuring that we have the economy that is developing those uh, higher paid jobs 
and also that we provide people with the skills to take those jobs. Looking and that's at, where what we're doing, for example, for young people on technical sure. skills is but so important. Looking at what's happening in the real economy, this sounds very much like continuity austerity is Theresa May's message. Do you ever pause and wonder whether you've got it wrong? What I want to do is to ensure that as we take look at the circumstances we're in at the moment, because things have changed and life will be different in the future, we won't be in the European Union any longer. We need to get those Brexit negotiations right. I want a strong hand in those negotiations right. if I'm Prime Minister. Let me give you another that example means, then. Well, if can, I I just finish, can I just finish this, this uh, point? It's about those Brexit negotiations, but it's also about enthusiastically embracing the opportunities that Brexit will give us as a country. That's an opportunity to develop our economy, to develop those high pay, higher paid jobs, and to develop the skills that people need to take those jobs. Would that include an opportunity to properly fund schools? Because in England, primary schools are facing a three billion pound cut by 2020. And lots of parents watching this program are well aware that parents are having to come in and fill in for uh, classes where there aren't enough teachers to be to be provided for. Um, there are raffle sales for books. Education in England in particular is badly underfunded. And I ask you again, is there any prospect of change if people vote for Theresa May as oh, Prime Minister? Let's look at actually what is happening in education. We said that we will protect the core schools budget and we have done that. In well, fact, the level of funding, funding is falling. In fact, the level of funding going into schools is at record levels. It's something like forty one billion pounds this but a lot year more pupils what as we're well. also what we're also looking at yes and as the number of pupils increases the number of m the money going into schools increases but, but what we're also funding is falling as, and it's going to carry well, on falling we have until protected 2020 that core schools budget but what we are also looking at is introducing a greater degree of fairness in the way in which schools are funded um, Everybody okay, well, across the political spectrum has accepted that the current way that we allocate funding to schools is unfair. We want to bring in a much uh, fairer system of funding for schools. We've uh, made some proposals, we've consulted on them, and obviously we'll be responding you, you, with our final proposals in due course. You don't accept my figures, Prime Minister. Here's the National Audit Office. Mainstream schools have to make £3 billion in efficiency savings, that's cuts, by 2019-20 against a background of growing pupil numbers and a real-term reduction in funding per pupil. And I say to you again, surely you have to rethink what's going on in schools. We have... What we need to look at in schools is to make sure that we have a fair funding system mm. that is, is ensuring that the way that money okay. is allocated to schools is fair and is fair across the country. One of the reasons that the Conservatives have had to oversee so many cuts in so many areas is that under the last government you made an absolutely clear and to many people ridiculous promise to never raise income tax, VAT or national insurance, the so-called triple tax lock. Are you going to repeat that? We have absolutely no plans to increase the level of tax uh, but I'm also very clear that I don't want to make specific proposals on on taxes unless I'm absolutely sure that I can deliver on those but it is would be my intention as a Conservative government and as a Conservative Prime Minister to reduce the uh, taxes on working families and if you've got but, strong but and stable would, so leadership accept, that's absolutely what you can do. You would accept that that tax lot was going too far. Your Chancellor thinks it tied his hands a little bit too tightly. Look, well, when people come to look at this uh, decision at the next election on June the 8th, they will have a choice between a Conservative Party that has always been a low-tax party, that actually over the last few years has taken four million people out of paying income tax altogether, and a okay, Labour right. Party that is about raising taxes, that is about higher taxes for the future. So a Conservative Party that believes in lower taxes and whose intention is to reduce the taxes on working families or a Labour Party that wants to increase tax. You mentioned social care a moment ago and you have said that this is a huge issue for the country. It can't carry on ducking. It's big, big news for the NHS. Have you come to proposals to help us on social care? Well, I've, as I've said before, I think if we look at this issue on social care, we need to think of it as a, there are short-term measures to take, and we've taken that. We've, in the budget, we put £2 billion mm -hmm. extra into social care. In the medium term, we need to make sure that good practice is spread across the whole of the country. If you look at things like delayed discharges from hospital, which is yeah. where hospitals interact with local authorities are we going on to social see a step care. Change on this? There are three I said there are three stages mm -hmm. to this. There's the short term. £2 billion pounds extra going in. There's the medium term, which is about spreading best practice around the country. Mm -hmm. And longer term, we need to 
uh, have a sustainable solution for social care. And yes, we have been working on that sustainable solution. And these issues, an issue like this about the impact of our ageing population, is exactly the just sort of long-term... tell us a little bit term, more about the sustainable solution then. It, well, it will just, uh, is exactly the long sort of long-term issue that I want to address for the future. And uh, if you want to know what's in our manifesto, Andrew, you'll have to wait until the manifesto is published. All right. Is the triple lock on pensions still safe? Under a Conservative government, the state pension will still go up every year uh, um, of the next parliament. Exactly how we calculate that mm -hmm. increase um, will be for the manifesto. And you'll, as I've just mm -hmm. said, you'll have to wait for the right. uh, manifesto to see what's in it. But uh, what we see already is that under, because of the actions taken under Conservatives in government uh, on the basic state pension, pensioners are £1,250 a year better off and under a Conservative government the state pension will continue to rise each what year. What about pensioners whose pension funds collapse at the same time as their bosses are heading off the Mediterranean into yachts with vast amounts of money in their back pockets? That is going to change, is it? Yes, it is, because I think this is one of the injustices. I think we have seen examples, uh, a limited number, we have seen examples where workers have been really worried about the future mm. of their pensions because of the actions that's been taken. So what we would do is we would bring in new rules and new powers for the pensions regulator so that if in certain circumstances where companies were being taken over, uh, there would be new powers for the regulator to make sure that the issue okay. around people's future pensions was being addressed so they had reassurance of the future of and their pensions. if this was in practice in the future, would a future Sir Philip Green be prosecuted and possibly jailed for what he did? Well, we would also be introducing greater powers to take action against individuals if what they were doing was right. about trying to effectively trying to destroy people's pensions for the future. Let's turn to l'éléphant dans la chambre, Brexit. Um, you said in your Lancaster House speech that no deal was better than a bad deal. Do you stand by that? Yes, I do. Uh, I think it's important, but I also think it's important that we go in there with the strength of hand in negotiations to get the good deal for the, uh, for the British people. That's what I want to do. And that's why I say that every vote for me and my team on June the 8th will strengthen my hand in those negotiations. Because you've now had a private conversation with Mr Juncker and um, the rest of the team, and it doesn't seem to have gone terribly well because Jean-Claude Juncker said apparently to Angela Merkel after meeting you, it went very badly. She is in a different galaxy. Based on that meeting, no deal is much more likely than finding agreement. Was it that, was it that bad a meeting? <laughs> no, look, I'm, I'm not in a different galaxy, but I think what this shows and what some of the other comments we've seen coming from European leaders uh, shows is that there are going to be times when these negotiations are going to be tough. And that's why you need strong and stable leadership in order to conduct those negotiations and get the best deal for Britain. I'm confident we can get a deal. You see the Trade Commissioner, Cecilia Malmström, has been very clear that mm. she thinks we will get a trade deal. But we've also seen the 27 standing absolutely shoulder to shoulder on the question of wanting a deal on money before they will even talk to us about trade and other issues. And they made that very, very clear this weekend. And then uh, the Luxembourg Prime Minister is talking about between 40 and 60 billion pounds worth of deal to be sorted out. Can I put it to you that if you win this election, if you get a big majority, the first thing that you will do is go over there and sign the cheque. Now, they're, what they're very clear about is, yes, they do want to start some discussions about, uh, about money. Um, I'm very clear that at the end of the negotiations, we need to be clear not just about the Brexit arrangement, the exit, how we withdraw, but also what our future relationship is going to be. These negotiations are going to be tough. The are you, are you prepared to agree on the money before you agree on everything else? I want to ensure that we agree on a trade deal and our withdrawal arrangements so that we know what both of those are when we leave the European but Union. They are but they're saying if you, look you at, must agree the money no, first. No, they, they have... Uh, if you look at what is being said in the guidelines, they say that they want to start the discussions on a number of issues. There are things that we absolutely agree on should be early in those discussions. The position of EU citizens living here in the UK and the position of UK citizens living in those 27 European countries. Absolutely, we agree, should be early so, in the discussions. They also agree, if you look at the guidelines, mm. that we should be discussing the development of a special partnership for the future. Sure. So there I is much on which that, we agree but, on. But it is absolutely critical to this issue and to the election campaign 
you are saying that you will not agree to pay a large bill to the EU until the entire negotiations are finished, yes and or no? The, and the EU itself has also said uh, that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. All right, well, let's move on to some of the other issues. You mentioned EU citizens. Now, um, if I was somebody watching this programme, and perhaps I was married to a French or German citizen, I'd be very, very worried about their status and my children's status in the future. Jeremy Corbyn has said that if I become Prime Minister on day one, I guarantee their status. Why can't you do the same? I believe that as the United Kingdom Prime Minister, it's important that I have a care for UK citizens who are currently living in the 27 countries, uh, remaining countries of the European Union. Mm. That's why I say I think this is about reciprocity. I think it is about us. I want to be able to guarantee EU citizens living here their rights and their status. Um, but I think it's important that we ensure that UK citizens uh, living in Europe have their rights and status guaranteed right. as well. There is goodwill there. Is if you look at my... Sorry, Andrew, if I, I think this mm. is an important point. If you look at my Article 50 letter, uh, which triggered... The letter that triggered Article 50, I hope, was very clear that I believe the rights of EU citizens here and UK citizens in Europe should be an early discussion, should be an early agreement for, point of agreement for us. And if you look at the guidelines, that's exactly what the EU has, the 27 have agreed as well. There's goodwill there. I believe we can give that reassurance to people at an early stage. Do you think the richest people in this country, people perhaps in houses worth more than £5 million, are paying their fair share of taxes? Should they be asked to pay more, given that we've got a tough time still ahead of us? If you look at what has happened in terms of tax, the top 1% uh, of people paying uh, tax are actually paying a higher uh, burden, a higher share of tax than under us, under a Conservative government, than they did in any year under a Labour government. But going ahead? I, I think that it is right that we ensure that the tax system is balanced. As I've been clear, uh, it, it would be my intention to reduce taxes on working families. I think you Including can see. The I think you can see. From the fact, well, let's look and see what we've done as uh, in relation well, to tax. Let's not go back to history. We haven't got time no. for history. Well, I'm I think our record is important in this well, tax issue. And we've taken can read four it. million people okay. out of paying income tax, and 30 million people have seen a tax cut, which, to a basic uh, rate payer, is worth about a thousand pounds a I've year. I've just been having a conversation with Tim Farron about his attitude to gay sex. You are also a Christian. Do you think that gay sex is a sin? No. And do you think that looking at what happened to Tim Farron, I know he's a rival leader in all of that, that there is an aggressively judgmental mood being imposed on Christians in this country that other groups don't have to face? Yeah. I think that obviously if anybody who is a leader of a political party, who is putting themselves up for election, who is asking right. the public to trust them, is bound to get a whole range of questions from a whole range okay. of, of different groups. Some people think the reason that you called this election is that 30 Conservative candidates and or agents are under investigation by the Crown Prosecution Service, could be facing charges quite soon. Can I ask if that issue was discussed at all when you were discuss that, that, discussing that, the election. That is not the reason why this election has been called. And let's be clear, in relation to the Electoral Commission issue, local, uh, local spending was properly declared. Uh, we did, the Conservative Party did make an administrative error on its national spending. Uh, it, uh, as did other parties. We have paid our if, fine. I would expect other parties to do so. If people are facing so. election, CPS uh, action, should they be able to stand? Well, the CPS is an independent body which will make decisions about whether or not it takes actions on individuals. Okay. Uh, what I'm very clear about in this election is that this election is about the national interest. It is right. about the future of our country. And, and have, that's why I say to people, raised, I want to see so, everybody voting. And you have raised again and again the question of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, can I put it to you that when it came to one of the most important votes that we've had in recent times on the Iraq war, whatever you think of Jeremy Corbyn, he was on the right side looking at history and you were on the wrong side. You went into the voting lobbies behind Tony Blair and voted for the Iraq war, which had so many disastrous consequences. And he did the unpopular thing and stood out against it. On that, at least, he was right and you were wrong. If we look at this choice at this election, the choice people will be making is who do they want to see as prime minister? Who do they want to see leading those Brexit negotiations? Who do they want to see defending this country? What Jeremy Corbyn has shown it, it, is that he's not prepared to stand up for the defence of this if country. You, if you knew, His economic if policies you now, simply what, don't add up. If you knew you then what you knew now, would you still vote for the Iraq? Would you still have voted for the Iraq war? Well, that's a hypothetical, uh, Andrew. You can well, only vote at any point in time on do what you, you know. you voting for it? On what you've, I voted in the way that I thought was right. Uh, when that vote came into Parliament. Mm. But he was right on that and you were wrong. Isn't that the truth? 
No. I voted in the way that I believed was right mm. uh, when the vote came to, uh, to Parliament. If we look ahead, there will be tough decisions to be taken. I think it's important that we have in number 10 a Prime Minister willing to defend this country, to stand up for the defence of this country. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn has shown right. he's not willing to do that okay. with economic policies that thank will take this indeed. country forward. Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed. We've covered a lot. That's all we've got time for this morning. We'll be back at the same time next meet with more on the election as well as one of our most beloved actresses, Imelda Staunton. Until then, goodbye. Next this morning on BBC.